Well, as Tim mentioned, uh, now is the time where we're going to turn our attention to the Word of God. Uh, We are in Luke chapter 14. Uh, If you're new here with us, uh, we kind of work our way through books of the Bible, and we've been in the book of Luke for a little while. Uh, Today, uh, verses uh, 12 to 24. Uh, If you were with us a couple of weeks ago, David uh, took us through the passage just before this one, which was the parable of the wedding feast. Today, uh, if you have a Bible in front of you, you'll see a subheading there that says, probably parable of the great banquet. So we had uh, a feast, now we have a banquet, lots of references to food, and I want to use that kind of just to help us with the structure of our time together. Uh, When you have a a big feast, like a big meal, there usually are uh, more than one course, more than one entree. Uh, We had our team appreciation dinner uh, a few weeks ago. James Groot uh, was the caterer. It was delicious. And he had more than one main entree. He had a pasta dish, which was just really good. And then he had a meat dish. And so two courses. That's how I want us to think of this sermon because our text naturally divides kind of into two parts. So we'll think of it in terms of courses. The first course is going to be verses 12 to 14, how to be a godly host. And then the second course will be verses 15 to 24, and that will be the parable of the great banquet itself, and it indeed will be a feast for our our soul and for our heart. So let's turn to the first course, how to be a godly host. Uh, Just to set the stage, remind us, uh, this is a dinner party. Jesus is at a dinner party. Uh, There's lots of people sitting around. He's He's been teaching. He's been interacting with them. Uh, The first bit, verses 7 to 11, was how to be a godly guest. He just spoke on that. And now he's going to turn our attention to how to be a godly host. So let me read uh, the, the few verses, starting in verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So that's the first, first section we're going to look at. You'll notice in terms of Jesus' instruction, it's interesting, uh, he really is telling the people who not to invite. He says, uh, no family. Don't say amen on that, please. No family, <laughs> no friends. No rich neighbors. He wasn't here really, he wasn't trying to discourage just general hospitality. It's a fine thing to have your family and friends over for dinner. What he's trying to do here is to help them understand the point of hospitality from God's point of view. What he's saying is it it shouldn't be about you as the host. It should be about the ones being invited. So he's basically referencing something that I I think we know to be true just intuitively that there's a spectrum of people in our lives. Uh, Some of them are on the easy end of the spectrum and some of them would be on the harder end of the spectrum, right? There are people that we invite over that would be an easy invite, meaning uh, we invite them over, we know probably they're gonna have us back uh, the next week. And there's this kind of reciprocal relationship of of dinners and barbecues, which, which is great. But the truth of the matter is that inviting these kinds of people over doesn't really cost us that much. Because not only will they probably invite us back, but probably if we've had them over regularly, uh, they're people that we get along with easily. We have a group of friends like this. Uh, Couples that we've known for for years. We had them over not long ago, and it's just one of those evenings that's going to be easy. Meaning uh, we get along well, we have uh, shared experiences, we have inside jokes, we make each other laugh easily. The food is easy, just bring whatever, the the connections are easy. And by the end of those kinds of evenings, uh, even though we've expended a lot of energy, we've cleaned the house, we've cooked whatever, uh, we generally feel full. You feel kind of uplifted because of the nature of the the conversation and of the, the connection. And Jesus, he's not saying that's wrong. He's just saying, look, that's That's not the point of hospitality from God's point of view. The point is that you would genuinely serve, genuinely care for other people. So on the other end of the spectrum, there might be those that are are harder to have over for whatever reason. Uh, One evening that I can think of was was a harder evening was when we had a group of new immigrants over. Now, it was a fantastic evening, but it was a little bit harder because we didn't obviously have shared experiences. They were from Iran. They were connected through a friend of mine. There, there are all sorts of barriers, language barriers, cultural barriers. 
Uh, we really enjoyed hearing their story. I mean, fantastic story, people of faith, but it was just harder. There were a lot of kind of awkward pauses where we weren't quite sure what they were saying or what we were saying. There were cultural barriers, just lots of things that by the end of the evening, uh, we, we felt a bit depleted. It was good, but it was, it was harder work. And that's, that's what Jesus is saying is sort of the point. He's saying, look, when you're really a host, a godly host, it's not about you being filled, it's about you filling others. So here's how I'm going to phrase it, just to kind of encapsulate it. How to be a godly host, it means that we, you empty yourself for the sake of others. You give of yourself, you pour yourself out for the sake of others. If you think about the, the people that Jesus suggested that would be invited, right, the lame and the blind and the poor, there would have been a social cost at that time associated with that, meaning these were people that were shunned in society, not rightly, but that's what happened. And so if you were to invite some of these people over, you also would be, would be shunned. And Jesus is saying, exactly, exactly, that, that's the point, because it's not about you. It's not about you preserving your social status or somehow benefiting you. It's about blessing others. And we should take note of this because there's this kind of dynamic still in our, in our culture today, in our classrooms, in our offices, in our, in our church, in our youth group, in our neighborhood. There are people who, for whatever reason, uh, they would be more of a social liability rather than an asset. People who somehow would be difficult or, or different. People who, for some reason, we would, we would think would, would cost us. It would be difficult to have them over. And Jesus is saying, look, if you never reach out to those kinds of people, then you don't, you don't really understand my kingdom. You don't really understand the gospel. Because the thing that we have trouble grasping, but which is evidently true, is that we are these kinds of people to Jesus. It didn't benefit him in any way for him to reach out to us. In fact, it, co it cost him, right? We, we are a social liability. We're the morally filthy ones, the difficult ones. And yet he reached out to us. He extended the hand of hospitality. You see this uh, dynamic articulated in the book of Philippians. And it's interesting because there's a bit of a progression. So first, Paul is speaking about Jesus himself. Philippians 2.7, he says, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, by being born in the likeness of man. So referencing the incarnation, that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, glorious God himself, poured himself out into human flesh. Why? So that he could atone for our sins, so that he could, he could do what was necessary to show us love, to make us right with the Father. That's the, that's the gospel. But then Paul continues in verse 17, and he's speaking about him and the church, the Philippian church. And he says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So he's saying this, this is the pattern of the Christian life, that just as Jesus poured himself out for us, then we pour ourselves out for others. This is what hospitality looks like, that we're concerned with the care and, and blessing others, and we do it because we see that Jesus did it for us. And also, because as he says here in verse 14, we, we know that that's, that's where we will be blessed. That in doing this, we will be blessed by God. Verse 14 says, we will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So the question, the maybe obvious question, that we should be asking ourselves in light of this, this initial teaching is, is do we see this pattern in our lives? Like, not just, not just dinner parties, that's great, having people over, but in terms of our, are we extending the hand of hospitality to people in our lives that we just think, man, they, it would really, they seem like they, could, they would be blessed. They seem like maybe no one has invited them over for a while. They, they I mean, there's a couple on our block that when Don and I walk, they never make eye contact with us. They kind of give us the cold shoulder every time, and I've been thinking, you know what? Uh, we should probably invite them over, which would be really awkward. Because I'd have to begin by saying, hey, we've passed each other 12,000 times. You've never looked at me, but would you like to come over? I don't know. Like, it, it would be very awkward. But, you know, the, that seems like the kind of thing that Jesus is saying, that we would be those kinds of people that would be willing to have those kind of awkward conversations be at, for the opportunity to bless others. And that, indeed, we will be blessed because of that. So, so first thing we see here, 
To be a godly host is to empty ourselves in, in some way for the sake of others. Second course we see is the parable of the great banquet itself. Now, by this point uh, in the evening, if you look back through the, the passages, what you'll, what you'll notice, what you can put together pretty clearly is that by this point, Jesus has managed to offend everyone in the room, okay? So he started with the Pharisees. He healed someone on the Sabbath, which got them all bent out of joint. Then uh, he criticized the guests at the party for sitting in the wrong seats. He basically told them they're all full of themselves and they should humble themselves. And then now he's rebuked the host of the party for inviting the wrong people. So you can, you can imagine the kind of silence that would have filled the room. Everyone's like, ee. Right? The host is like, how are we going to salvage this? This is a train wreck. Why did, we, why did we invite Jesus? So there's one guy who senses the tension, and he's that kind of guy that has to fill the space. And he, he's thinking of something that he thinks would just uh, would make everyone feel at ease. Okay, So here's what he says. Here's verse 15. Uh, when one of those who reclined at table with him, with Jesus, heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So he was saying something that he thought everyone would agree with. He was expecting there to be sort of a yes and amen, right? If Phil Thiessen were there, he'd say, hear, hear, he would, if you know Phil. That, that's what he was, he was expecting just a general sense of, of, yeah, that the whole mood from the room would shift because... How, how can you disagree with this statement? Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Well, of course. Of course you're going to be blessed if you're in the kingdom, eating bread at God's table. Right, Jesus? Isn't, isn't that a great thing? Of course we're all looking forward to that glorious day when we'll be in heaven. Right, Jesus? Aren't you excited about this? Let, let's get this party going. Let's get the atmosphere. It's so cold in here, Jesus. But see, Jesus, he doesn't respond in the way that this guy thinks he should or would, he doesn't go along with the guy's statement at all. Not because uh, the statement is incorrect, but because the assumption behind the statement is all wrong. I mean, of course, those who feast in God's kingdom, they will be blessed, but that's not the issue. The real issue is, is will we actually be there in the kingdom to eat the bread? See, many people assume that they will be in the kingdom of heaven one day. Everyone at the party there, they assume, this guy assumed that he would be there. And so Jesus tells a parable to challenge that assumption and to lead them to examine their own faith and their own commitments to God. So that's the setup for the parable. That, that's what's going on here. And I'll read beginning in verse 16. But Jesus said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who've been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. She must have been quite a wife. I don't know. <laughs> um, then, then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, uh, sir, what you've commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled for I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. So, we're going to work through this parable uh, in three parts, three points. The first is this. Jesus invites us to a feast. Jesus invites us to a feast. So this parable is really about the kingdom of God. That tends to be what, what parables are about. They're an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so here you have uh, a man who very clearly is Jesus. In fact, by the end, uh, Jesus sort of says that they shall not taste my banquet. He's sort of putting himself in there in a sense. So the host, the man is Jesus. The guests are those who profess faith in God. And the banquet itself is heaven, is, is the kingdom. That's what this is all about. The man said, won't it be great when we're eating bread in the kingdom? And then Jesus says, well, let me tell you in a sense about the kingdom. 
Now, you'll notice uh, that the guests for this banquet, they actually got two invitations, which was customary at the time. Uh, they would, like if you're planning a big feast, a big party, you would send out the servants to do the first invitation. It's kind of like a save the date, right? Kind of like, like a wedding. You get it, hey, next summer it's coming up, or in a few months it's coming up. But the difference here is that they, their uh, relationship with time was not as specific as ours. So when we get a wedding invitation, it says August 10th, wherever it is, 2 p.m. And we don't get another invitation, we just know we should be there. But back in that day, they didn't, the timing was rarely that specific. So they knew the day, but it would take a while. They have to slaughter the animals, get them ready, prepare everything. So once it was ready, then the servants would be sent out for the second invitation, which we saw in verse 17. Come, everything is now ready. Right? They were kind of waiting. They knew it was happening this afternoon sometime. It's, it's ready now. Okay, come. And it was just generally, in fact, universally expected that you would come. That if you said yes to the first invitation, you would say yes to the second invitation. And the reason for that, uh, or there's two reasons, both of them fairly obvious. Number one, it'd be very rude to say yes to the first one and not to the second. And, and like, not just a social faux pas, but like very rude, like, like intentionally offending the host. This would, this would be like if someone was having a destination wedding and it was all expenses paid. We want you to be there. We're going to Hawaii. We'll, we'll pay for your airfare, your hotel. Come celebrate with us. It's happening next spring break. Excellent. I'm going to be there. It's going to be great. And then the day of the flight comes, and you're like, oh, I forgot. My dog needs his shots. I didn't realize. I'm sorry. I can't come. The person, it would, that would be a major offense. Like, you're intentionally offending us because of all the things, we've, all the expense we've, we've gone to. So no one would, would do that, generally speaking. But the second reason why no one would say no is that, I mean, this is a, a great banquet. This is a huge feast. When you're invited to a great banquet, you know that you are going to be stuffed. You know that you're going to be fully satisfied. I mean, your stomach to, to the brim. These kind of opportunities don't come very often. So if you get invited to this kind of a dinner, everyone would say yes. I was invited to this kind of a dinner recently. And I can testify that... It is fantastic. A friend of mine said, look, I want to take you to a Canucks game. I want to take you for dinner. I was like, great. That's, that, that sounds great. He wouldn't tell me where. He just sent me a text a week before. He said, listen, come hungry. We're going to eat seriously. He said, Bri- take some pills if you need to because we're going to eat, <laughs> which, which put me on my guard. And it was especially, I was a little nervous because I had just had my gallbladder out like two weeks prior. <laughs> And if you know something about gallbladders, we, we don't really need them, but they kind of help. And so some people, uh, if you have your gallbladder out, they can't eat very much, but others are okay. And I didn't know where I was. I was eating a low-fat diet, getting ready. And so I was like, Don, I have to get ready for this. So I started a regimen. I had grilled cheese, pasta, cookies, pie. We went out for dinner. I said, we have to have a test meal. So I want to make sure all the pipes are working. <laughs> Ate a big dinner. So by the time it came, I was ready to go grab my Tums. And he took me to this place I didn't know existed. It's called the Captain's Room in Rogers Arena. Have you heard of this place? It's like a legit sort of fine dining restaurant. It's not like in the concession area. No one knows about it, I guess. I didn't, unless you, you know about it. And when you go in, it's like this buffet. I mean, they had roast beef. They have salmon. They have, they have crab legs. They have mussels, which I didn't eat. They have charcuterie, this huge thing. And you just go before the game, and you start eating plate after plate after plate. When the game starts, they give you to-go stuff. You take it down to your seats. You watch the first period. You come back. The food's still there. You keep eating and eating and eating. You go. You come back for the second intermission. They've taken it away. It's dessert buffet. So then you eat more and more. I'm stuffed. I'm so stuffed. Putting stuff in my pockets by the end. (sighs) I walked out of there like full to the brim and praising Jesus. This is a Christian friend I was with. I was like, God, this is what stomachs are for. This is what taste buds are for. That, that is what Jesus is talking about here. This great banquet is a picture of heaven because that, that is heaven. Heaven is, is a place, a reality, where we are fully satisfied. When we walk into heaven, through the gates of heaven, we will realize what all of our senses are actually for. Right? We have eyes so that we can gaze upon the glories of God. We have ears to hear the, the chorus of heaven. Right? We have a sense of smell to to inhale the fragrance of heaven and, and skin and, and the sense of touch to, be, to feel the warm embrace of our Savior. We will be there and be fully satisfied. And the amazing thing of it is that the host of heaven, Jesus himself, he paid our way. Hallelujah. 
That's the gospel, right? That, that he laid down his life, that the doors would be flung open wide. So here, here's the thing. In light of this invitation, no one rejects this kind of an invitation. If you know that this is what you're in for, you would never say no. And yet, in this parable, all of the invited guests say no. That's the, as the people were listening to this, that's what they would have, that would have stuck out. How would you, why would you say no? What is up with that? How could you reject this kind of an invitation? This is our second point. First one was that Jesus invites us to a feast. Secondly, our tastes deceive us. Our tastes deceive us. See, when the servant went to tell everyone the party was on, you'll notice they had a lot of excuses. But you don't have to look very closely to see these were very lame excuses. Right? Let's, let's look at them. Verse 18, the first one said, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Like the field would not be there tomorrow. Like you'd buy a major piece of real estate and not look at it. This doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. The next one, verse 19, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. That's like buying a boat or an RV, but you didn't actually check it out. And again, where are they going? Why, why can't you do that tomorrow? It doesn't make any sense. Verse 20, another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Your wife doesn't like parties? I mean, it doesn't, it, none of this really makes any sense at all. And in fact, these issues that they bring up, these are not the real issue, right? The real issue is that these people, they just don't want to go to the banquet, clearly. They had, they had better things to do. And we know what this is like. I mean, this is familiar to us, especially in our day. People are always looking for a better offer, right? People cancel all the time because there's a better party, a better event, a better invitation. But the interesting thing here is that at the time, what could be better? What, what other major thing is, is happening? There should be nothing better than to attend a feast like this. So how, how does that happen? How do you say no to that kind of an invitation? And the answer, the answer is that it's all about taste. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, recently, I heard an interview with a very famous French chef. His name is Eric Repair. Repair, I don't know in French what it is. But he is head chef, actually, at a very famous restaurant in New York called Le Bernardin. This is, like, at the top, you know, the best restaurants in the world. It's always on the list, always near the top of the list. It has three Michelin stars, not just this year, but, like, for the past decade, every year, which is incredibly difficult to get. You have to make reservations at this place like months and months and months in advance. If you're a foodie, it's on your list. If you're going to travel the world, this is one of the places that you would go. So I was listening to this interview, and I was like, man, this place, this place sounds amazing. It sounds, so I went to the website. I wanted to check it out. And it, I mean, it looks classy, right? It's a fine dining place. But what I noticed as the food was scrolling by, you know, all the menu, I didn't, I didn't really, frankly, see anything that I thought I would like. And part of that was because it's like a seafood place. I mean, I like a good salmon, but they had all these weird, like, red snapper and rock fish. But also, it's fine dining, so there's these little things like this. And I thought to myself, you know, even if, I was in, if I could get a reservation at Le Bernardin, I don't, I don't know that I would go. I certainly wouldn't pay the $200 uh, a, a place to go there. But even if someone invited me for free, I think I'd probably have to stop at a w on the way because <laughs> I would not really enjoy it. And what I realized is that my taste buds are not suited for Le Bernardin. Th th I haven't cultivated a palate that would really enjoy this kind of fine dining. It would be wasted on me. If I love five guys, I'm not going to go to this place and really be able to enjoy it. And so my, my point here is that our tastes, our tastes are shaped by what we consume. Not just for food, but for everything in our lives, including our spiritual lives. See, if you think about the people here and and why they rejected this banquet. If you look at it, it comes down to two things. Material possessions, uh, oxen and fields, and earthly affections, which, which is a very neat summary of pretty much all the things that human beings think are very, very, very important but don't benefit us at all eternally. And also is a neat summary of the kinds of things that, that keep people from faith. See, there's another parable parable of the soils. Do you remember this one where, where Jesus is speaking about, about people? And he says they're kind of like different kinds of soils. And the, the word of God is like a seed put in these different soils. One of the soils has a lot of thorns in it. So the seed of faith that tries to grow gets, gets choked out. 
And look at how Jesus explains this. This is Luke 8, 14. He says, And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear the word of God, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. So they, they hear, they, they have the seed of faith in a sense. They might respond a little bit, but then really the things of life, the, notice the pleasures of life. These are the trials of life. These are the good things in life that kind of chokes out the faith that is growing within them. And this, this is what we also see here in the parable, that even though they've been invited to this grand banquet, their interests, their affections, their tastes are for other things, other things that, that they think are more important, more interesting, more palatable. And this is not hard for us to see to this day all around us, in our culture, in our church, in our lives. Let me, ju let me just give you one example of, of where I see this, one thing. Gathering as the church. Okay, there are people who uh, would consider themselves to be Christians and yet only kind of manage to gather with the church maybe, maybe once a month, maybe twice a month, very sporadically. So think about that for a minute. These are people that have some sense of the fact that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. God himself came in human flesh, was whipped and beaten, died for their sin, rose again. He's their savior. They, they might say that, and yet somehow don't, don't manage to actually gather with people who are worshiping Jesus at least even once a week. How, how does that happen? Well, it, it must be that there's something else in their lives that just seems sweeter, seems more attractive, seems, seems more important. And it could be lots of things, right? It could be a hike, it could be yard work, it could be sleeping in, it could be just getting a jump on, on the week. But my point is, what does it say about our spiritual taste buds if we'd rather be somewhere else than, than worshiping with the people of God, worshiping Jesus gathered together, sitting under the teaching of his word? And if you think I'm picking on you, it's just one thing, right? If you're watching online and you think I'm talking to you, I kind of am, but I'm, I'm saying... I'm saying it's just one thing. Right? You guys are all here, so you don't care. <laughs> I'm saying there's all sorts of things like that that we're called to, uh, like sacrificial giving, like forgiving others, like, like the disciplines of faith, being in prayer. There, there are all sorts of words that God gives, invitations, and yet we, we don't have a taste for it. It just seems kind of bland, so we, we don't do it. And yet there are other things in our lives, the, the things of this earth, that seems so compelling. See, this isn't a small thing. This is everything. Because you notice by the end, by verse 24, what does Jesus says? He says, I, I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Meaning, they may have thought that they would one day be there in the kingdom of heaven, but in the end, they didn't taste anything in the feast that Jesus was offering. Why? It's one coin with two sides. Why weren't they there? On the one side, it's because they didn't want to be there. All their lives, they've demonstrated they're not, they don't really want the things of heaven. They don't have a, a taste for the things of heaven. So why would, why would they end up in heaven? That They don't want it. But on the other side of the coin, they're judged because they've rejected God. They're judged because their hearts are, are really full of idolatry. Other things that seem sweet but actually have deceived them. And more than that, they've allowed themselves to be deceived. That's why it says in Psalm 34, right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's an invitation by God. Taste. Don't, don't just intellectually assent to the things of faith, but actually live it out, right? Cultivate your taste in such a way that the things of heaven taste sweet. You recognize the, the, the wonder, the, the glory of the, the things that God gives us and how he wants to shape us. See, we shouldn't be satisfied with lesser things when a banquet awaits. That's what we're seeing here in this parable as Jesus describes it. We need to be thinking about what we're cultivating, how we're being shaped by the things that we are, we are feasting on before heaven. So that's the second thing, that our, our tastes deceive us. But the third, the third thing is this. His house will be filled. This is what's very clear at the end of this parable. His house will be filled. So like many parables about the kingdom, uh, it's also a parable about the king. And here we see uh, that this great banquet is rejected, but really they're rejecting the host. 
and he gets angry, understandably so. It's, it's a rude offense that they are, they're making. But notice, uh, in light of this, he doesn't close his doors. The host doesn't say, fine, we're just canceling the banquet. What we see is that he opens them wider. We see the true breadth and the depth of his hospitality because two other groups of people are now invited in. And so the first group are the, we could call them outcasts. Verse 21. Uh, the, the, the man says to his servants, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. So really, uh, this is Jesus practicing what he preached. Because this is what he told us to do. If you want to be a godly host, invite in these kinds of people, the, the quote-unquote outcasts of society, and he's doing this very thing. He's saying this is, the kingdom of God is open to all those who might feel rejected, who might feel cast out, who might feel disadvantaged, which is just a testimony to the heart of God, to, to, the, to the fact that the doors of heaven are indeed open wide. The grace and mercy of God and the acceptance of any one of us have felt those things in our lives from people we need to know that's not how God sees us. That, that, that the invitation is open, that he wants for all those who feel like an outcast to be welcomed in. But that's not all. The second group of people that are welcomed in are the Gentiles. Here we see this in verse 23. He says, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Now, the reason I say that this refers to the Gentiles, those who are not Jews, uh, is two reasons. Number one, just in the picture of that little community, uh, he's telling the servants to go to the highways and hedges. That would have been people who are traveling, those people who are, are not part of the community of faith, that those would have probably been those who are not Jewish. But the second reason that I think these are the Gentiles is because we're told explicitly in Romans 11 that God intended to graft the Gentiles into the tree of faith. In fact, that's what we see in the early church, in the book of Acts. The apostles, right, Jesus dies, he's, he's in the grave, he rises, he's back up to heaven, he says, go and tell people the gospel, and they start by telling Jews the gospel, because Jesus was Jewish, he's the Jewish Messiah. And so they begin by going into synagogues and telling people the Messiah is here, here's the good news from God, you can be forgiven of your sin, but many Jews uh, reject the gospel just like in the parable. They, they, don't, they don't listen. They're not interested. And so the apostles, they turn their attention to Gentiles. And people are astonished because Gentiles are actually coming to faith. Uh, here's a little example of it. Acts 10, verse 44. While Peter was saying these things, he's, he's preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, uh, that's the Jews, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. See, here in this parable, Jesus is anticipating that this would happen. He's saying to the people there who are all, all Jews, he's saying, look, if you don't want to come to the banquet of God, that's fine. You will bear the consequences from that decision, but the banquet itself will go on. The house of God will be full. There will be a feast in the kingdom. We see it in Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's this beautiful picture of people coming, feasting, actually eating bread in the kingdom of God, and the table will be full. It will be for the good of the people there and for the glory of God. So the only question, the real question for the people in the room and for the people here in this room, for us, is will we be there? Will we be feasting at the table? And we shouldn't assume we would be. It's like that guy, right? He wanted to warm up the room. He wanted to say something. Hey, everyone agrees, right? It's going to be great, Jesus. When we're there eating bread together in the kingdom. But he wasn't paying attention to his life. He wasn't, he wasn't paying attention to his faith. He wasn't thinking about the taste that he was cultivating in his heart and his mind. See, all of them in that room... They thought they were headed for the kingdom. But in the end, none of them would taste it. And it had everything to do with their heart. It had everything to do with whether they were actually interested in the things of God, and specifically in Jesus as the Messiah. And that's the same thing for us. Are we actually interested in Jesus? So here's a final illustration uh, that I hope will be helpful. 
There's a book that came out in, in 2004 uh, for women. Uh, you might recognize the title. It was called He's Just Not That Into You. Remember that book? Um, it was a book for women about dating, right? He's Just Not That Into You. Now, just to be very clear, I'm not recommending this book, okay? I didn't, I've actually read this book. I don't think you should read this book. Sometimes I give examples and people are like, oh, it's a great summer devotional. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> we have books for you out there on the shelf. I'm just saying it's a good example because the point of the book is, is to ladies, look, if, there's, if you're in a relationship with a guy and he's not putting any effort into that relationship, he's not pursuing you in any way, then he's probably just not that into you. It, you, you should recognize the signs of what's going on, and that is a fair point, that that's actually true in all relationships, that if there's a friendship or any you know, relationship and the person is not actually putting any effort into it, they're probably not really into it. And I'm using this because the same is true for our relationship with Jesus, if we flip it. Okay, if we're not putting any effort, if we're not interested in, in the things of God, if we're not really interested in praying, if we're not really interested in coming to worship together, if we're not really putting much effort into knowing Jesus, then it could be that you're just not really that into Jesus. The point of the book is, is for ladies, look, if he's just not that into you, it's not the end of the world. It's not a big deal. There's other guys out there who will be into you. You should move on. But the point of the parable is the opposite. If you're not that into Jesus, it is the end of the world. It's the end of everything. You can try to move on. And there's a lot of other suitors out there, in a sense, a lot of other things in this world that are vying for your attention, right? There's oxen, there's fields, there's wives, there's other good things, not necessarily horrible things, but things that you could devote your life to. The problem is that at the end, where does it leave you? It leaves you empty. It leaves you on the outside of the kingdom of God. And so the question, the question that Jesus is, is, is implying here is, look, do we, do we care are we concerned? Are, are we right now cultivating a taste for the things of heaven in anticipation of actually being in heaven one day? Or, or are we devoting our lives to things that will not satisfy us in the end? And you can tell by the things that you're actually doing, by the things that you're tasting, the things that you are feasting on. This section of scripture, it, it's about invitations, right? The first bit, who are you inviting into your home? What does that say about your heart? But but really, it's about, are you responding to the invitations of God? And if you are, praise Jesus. Praise God for his work in your life. But if you aren't, do you, do you know that he's such a gracious host? That the doors are still open wide. And that regardless of how long it has been since you've sampled the things of heaven, any spiritual things, you, you can start today. And I'm going to end by praying for all of us. That that would be stirred up in our, in our hearts and be lived in our lives. So let's pray for that. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you are a perfect host, that, that you give everything so that the doors of heaven would be open, so that there would be a, a feast waiting for us. But Lord, the truth is that it's, it's difficult for us, even those of us who've, who've expressed some semblance of faith, it's, it's difficult for us to actually keep our eyes fixed on that, and we get distracted. We allow ourselves to be distracted by so many other things that seem sweeter seem more satisfying, and yet the truth is in the end they will leave us empty. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray you'd help us. Please, Holy Spirit, would you help us? For those, for those who, who have expressed faith, for all of us, Lord, in that camp, I pray that, that we would continue to cultivate a sense of, of appreciation for an interest in the things of God, that the things that you tell us to do in Scripture that the patterns of heart and mind and life, that we would engage in those things confident that by doing so, we would be full, that we would be, we would be full daily by the power of your spirit, by the, the truth of your word. And Lord, that we would be in a position to pour ourselves out for others. But I also pray, Lord, for those who, who haven't really expressed faith, or maybe it's been a long, long time. God, I pray that today would be a day where they realize that the things that they've been feasting on are are going to leave them empty in the end. And that the things of God, though it might taste unfamiliar, are so much sweeter and so much more satisfying. And so, Lord, I pray that you would move in their heart in a powerful way and that they wouldn't leave this place without talking to someone, might, taking steps of faith. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. May, may you shape us in the way we need to be shaped for your glory and for our good. I pray this in your name. Amen.